from PowerShell.org. Um, my name is Nicholas Ketchell, and I'm here with Dave Wyatt, the Microsoft MVP. He's an Applications Operations Engineer for the DevOps guys, and he's here going to present about um, uh, build.powershell.org. Dave? Hello. All right. Uh, well, as you're probably aware, if you're interested in this webinar, uh, build.powershell.org is a free community build server that we spun up about uh, a month, a month and a half ago, something like that. And uh, it's using JetBrains TeamCity as the, the product, mainly because that's what I'm most familiar with since we use it at work. <laughs> and, uh, and we could get a free license for it uh, for, for open source projects, which is pretty spiffy. So um, I did put up a post sort of describing quickly how to onboard a project into uh, into the server. And if I go back to my homepage here, there's a, a link to that right off of build.powershell.org. And there's a, a template project that I create uh, your particular project off of when, when I first set it up. And there's a little bit of description of how that works, but the, the basic gist of it is that it will test your code by default on PowerShell versions 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, and if it's all green, then there's a, a build configuration here to uh, integrate back with GitHub, which is the, the most common source control uh, repository that people tend to be using right now. And it gives you a little uh, check mark for, so if, if you're looking at, for example, a pull request, if I go over to Pester, And if I look at our pull requests, you'll see that some of these have little red X's where the test failed, and some sometimes they'll have a little green check mark where the test succeeded. Um, and if you go into the details, it will give you a link over to, uh, oh, this is on our old build server, so that, that particular pull request is not on build.powershell.org, but um, so you get that kind of thing. And what I figured I'd go into in this webinar is not only how to get a little deeper understanding of what's going on in that template project, but also how to do some more with it, things that, uh, that I haven't really documented or shared yet, but uh, I wanted to get the knowledge out there. So one thing that I'll point out is that in Pester, um, we automatically publish our, uh, our builds out to PowerShell Get, the PowerShell Gallery, and Chocolatey and NuGet.org all automated through the build server. So um, the way that works is we've got this ensure version numbers and tags match. That's sort of our, our gate to control whether the automatic publishing happens or not, assuming that all the tests pass. So um, it will only automatically publish uh, Git commits that are tagged with a version number that matches what is in the module manifest and our readme file. And if any of those don't match, then we screwed up and we have to republish a new commit to fix that. Um, so with that, but before I, I dive into that too much, um, I'm going to go into the into the template project and show a little bit of how uh, how Team City works. So in every project under the general settings tab, um, and you'll you'll be able to see all this on projects that you own or are made an administrator of, but you will not be able to see a lot of the details of other people's projects. So if you're logged on as a guest or uh, you're not logged on as an account that has rights to a project, you'll, you'll not get a lot of this stuff. But if you, if you do own a project, you'll see all these. So every project has one or more build configurations. And build configurations are a bunch of steps that run on the same build agent in, in order. But build configurations themselves can run in parallel. So when we run test in PowerShell 2, 3, 4, and 5, those tests will actually all run at the same time. We'll spin up four build agents, one with uh, Windows Server 2008 R2 and PowerShell v2, one with Server 2012 and PowerShell v3, and so on. Um, and we'll run all the tests. And then the publish status to GitHub depends on all four of these. So if all four tests pass or fail, the sort of um, combined status is what goes back out to GitHub. And you can see that if you go into a, uh, into a project like Pester here, and you click on the build chains link, 
you can see that how that dependency graph maps out. So PowerShell 2, 3, 4, and 5 are shown as being sort of in parallel and then all funneling into this published status to GitHub. And then in the case of Pester from there to our published releases step. Um, in a particular um, project, where's Pester? Here we go. Uh, in a particular build configuration, you can have any number of build steps. In this case, it's it's only a single build step. But build steps can be all kinds of stuff. So if I click Add here, you can see they've got lots and lots of integrations for stuff. So you can um, run arbitrary PowerShell code or command line code. You can do MS build and... Uh, all kinds of compilation steps. You can create NuGet packages, publish them out to um, like chocolatey NuGet.org, you would do through a NuGet publish. Lots of stuff that I've never even used, but it's all there. <laughs> and uh, and there's even plugins we can install if there's other things that, that people want to be able to do. Um, for the most part, I use the PowerShell build runners because I like PowerShell. And in here, uh, when you're creating a new build step, you can you know, indicate what happens if uh, if previous steps failed. You can tell it what version of PowerShell you want it to run on and whether x86 or x64. Typically, you're going to want x64. Um, I tend to set this to error. And then you can do stuff. So uh, script, you can either put the source code right here in Team City, or you can have a file that's in your repository and just run that. So if you had a, a script named uh, you know, build.ps1 or something like that, then that would be fine. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the kind of thing here. Now in, in Pester, and in fact in the, in the template project, we put the source code right into the build step. And the reason for that is that TeamCity has some variables that it will expand for you um, right there in, in the file without having to set up the script to accept parameters and pass them on the command line and stuff like that. So instead, TeamCity will take this code that's in here and create a temporary .ps1 file on the build agent and all of these uh, things that look like old command line environment variables between the percent signs, they'll be expanded out in the code. And that includes variables that are marked as sensitive. So they're stored in encrypted form on the TeamCity server and not displayed in the UI, even to people that uh, administer the project, you can still have those variables expanded in your code. Um, so I'll show, and we, we don't have to look in this tiny little window. I've got, um, I've got some code, well, my mouse is going crazy, um, to, to show in a bit. Your build configurations, and any number of and any of these can have both dependencies defined, and they can have triggers. Um, so, and I want to point out that the way that uh, you typically use dependencies and triggers in Team City is you put the triggers at the end of a build chain. So if I go back out to Pester and show that uh, that build chain again. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear my toddler. Um, I've got a, a build trigger actually both on published status to GitHub and on published releases. I don't have triggers on these dependencies because they will automatically be uh, run because they are defined as dependencies. So if I go back into my uh, project settings here, I go into the published status to GitHub, you can see one, I've got a build trigger, which is just a VCS trigger is version control system. So because I've got a, uh, a VCS root for GitHub, I can just use that uh, pester GitHub here as the source. And I can say that as long as no new commits are coming in for a 60 second period, go ahead and run a build. Um, and then because I've got dependencies here defined, it will run all of these first and then take action based on that. Uh, two types of dependencies in Team City. You've got snapshot dependencies and you've got artifact dependencies. Snapshot dependencies are source code. So, um, and 
this is going to be what's most useful when you're working with PowerShell because you don't have to compile things uh, unless you're writing like a, a C sharp module. But um, a snapshot dependency, what will happen is when I run these uh, these builds here, they're going to be targeting the exact same commit as the commit that triggered the uh, that, that was in the trigger. So it doesn't matter what branch that commit happens to be in because of how Git works, the same commit can actually be in, in multiple branches that, that are all following along. And as long as a build has already been run for a particular commit, um, you can just reuse that status. Um, so that, that's an option here in dependencies. It says do not run new build if there's a suitable one. So if I've already tested something on uh, PowerShell v2 in a particular commit and it passed, it's just going to say fine, it passed. Um, in this case, anytime I make a change, it's going to trigger all these again anyway. But if you happen to have uh, a, a different kind of project structure, you can take advantage of that and not have to wait for new builds when it's unnecessary. Artifact dependencies are not triggered by source control. So let's take the example of a, a module like maybe PowerShell Community Extensions where it's a, a DLL file. So that's command that's written in C sharp. You would check something into source code first and you would uh, have like the very first step would be to compile your module into its DLL file. And then you would have another uh, bunch of build configurations that are for testing. And those build configurations would have an artifact dependency on the module that was produced in the compile step. So artifact dependencies, you can define which uh, build configuration they come from. So in this case, I'm going to pretend that I have a, a thing here. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a mess. Uh, so I, I'm trying to make something up here, but uh, you would do build from the same chain. That's going to say, um, it's sort of like the, the artifact dependency equivalent of a, uh, of a snapshot dependency. So what you're saying is from the artifact that came from this commit, use that, um, or you can do latest successful build if you, if you want to do that. But, uh, but I usually almost always do build from the same chain. And then your artifact rules are going to be the, the file. So you might have a zip file or a NuGet package or something like that that was produced by the, uh, by the previous step. So um, like I said, for the most part with PowerShell code, you're just going to be using snapshot dependencies. You don't have to worry about artifacts too much, but uh, understanding that that's there is, is good to have. Um, any, any project build configuration or build step can have parameters, and parameters are just basically variables. Um, you notice here that you can have variables that are stored as sensitive or secure, so they do not get exposed through the uh, through the web page, and, uh, and I can use them like this, but they are still available in the script. And in this case, this is the build.powershell.org username and password for a pester account. Um, that we use to interact with the REST API, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, and then if I go down into my build configurations, oh, I'm in one now. Uh, let's go down to here. No, never mind. It's I've only got the two. I thought I had some some more parameters, but it's not important. So. Um, if I go, so Dave, what are the sure. what other types of things would you keep inside of uh, Team City that you'd want to keep that you'd want to keep secure? Uh, well, here's an example: my API oh. key for uh, for PowerShell GET, um, my personal API key, in fact. Um, so, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. I, I use it in the build step. If I go down here to to publish to PowerShell Gallery, and again, I've, I'm going to have the code in a bigger window, but I can just say dollar API key equals, and it's going to get expanded in the script so that it's going to be there in plain text, but not in a place that anybody can read it. Um, this PS1 file, and in fact, everything on the build agent is going to get deleted and thrown away as soon as the build is done. So there's no, uh, there's no opportunity for other people to get a peek at this. Uh, one thing that you do want to be careful of, though, any console output 
from your script goes into a log file that is publicly readable. So I would not want to do, for example, write host my API key is, you know, if I do that, then it's, it's published to the world. So um, I'm not going to do that. But as long as I don't uh, allow that to, to go out to the console. But one place that you do, man, my mouse is just going absolutely up the wall. There we go. Um, one thing that you want to do is instead of passing this value directly to a command like that, store it in a variable first. And that way, if there are any errors, you know, PowerShell's default error output shows a portion of the command line or all of the command line if it's short enough. Um, so I would want it to show uh, let's see here, if I go down to publish module, what you would see in the log file is, man, is dollar sign API key and not the actual plain text string. So um, things to, to be aware of if, uh, if you're putting secret stuff in here. Um, they can still be surfaced. Yep. All right. Uh, so the other thing that I was going to look at um, in terms of explanation of, of the default stuff here, this GitHub status integration, there, it's under build features, and there's just a report change status to GitHub. This is configured all out of the box uh, with the template project. The only thing you have to do is put in a personal access token for either your own account or some account that has access to, to write to the... Uh, to the repository for your project. So um, there's a link explaining how this works on uh, out on PowerShell.org, but you can also um, come on, mouse. There we go. Nope. And right about now, I wish I had a touch screen. All right. Um, it looks yeah, like you have so. to create a, uh, a Team City module in PowerShell, so you don't need the mouse anymore. Well, to demonstrate this and show it on my screen. <laughs> I'm um, just kidding. Yeah. All right. So, um, I tend to use the used guest links um, checkbox here, so that when we go out to, um, for example. Pastor, and I, um, those those links that we were talking about before. When I click on the link, there we go. Oh, it's still on code better. Let me uh, let me find something more recent. There's status icons for branches as well. Um, so when I click on this link. I don't have to log in to see it because it appends this guest equals one bit to the query string. So it's just a nice way to, to get people to link. And if I were to take that off or if I did not check the, um, okay, <laughs> I didn't expect that to work. Um, let's try it again. Branches, I'm going to copy the, Link location. All right, never mind. I am accustomed to getting a login screen there. Maybe it's automatically uh, allowing guest access or something in, in this version of Team City. All right. Always fun when stuff works, and I didn't expect it to. Um, but yeah, it, you can also if if you don't want to use a personal access token, there's a you can just put in usernames and passwords too, and that's fine. It's either way, it gets encrypted in the Team City database and nobody else has access to read it. So um, it's it's yours either way. Um, I prefer access tokens because I can quickly revoke them and people don't, uh, don't get to steal my actual password. All right. uh, so that's, that's more or less what's in the, um, in the template and showing how the the build configurations work. Um, I can actually, if you want, I can go into a little bit more detail of uh, of what these do. For one thing, all of our build agents have Pester installed, so you can run tests. And they have uh, on the PowerShell v5 build agent, it has PowerShell get, so you can 
install dependencies that you need if, if they're out there, or you can uh, publish if you want to do that, whatever you want to do with that module. But in the step that runs the tests, you can see the code here. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick something other than Pester because Pester is a little bit different because it has to test itself. Um, but if I go into, let's say, protected data and project settings, test on whatever, this one was built from the template and Pester was not. That was sort of copied over from our old builds here. Um, so yeah, you've got the checkout directory is where your uh, repository got cloned to by the build server, by the build agent. Uh, it imports Pester. It creates an output path for for um, end unit test output, which integrates nicely with TM City and is all configured in the template. And then it just runs invoke Pester uh, based on whatever path. And if anything fails, it aborts the, uh, or it logs this as a failure. So you know, you could have tests that pass on version 5 and fail on version 2 if you've got some syntax that uh, it doesn't work. That's the sort of nice thing about being able to test on all versions at once. Uh, so this is very, very simple. It's, it's essentially just running invoke pester. Um, so I don't really need to, to go too much more into that. Um, so now we can get into the, the cooler things that, that aren't in the template, but you might want to be able to do. Uh, one thing is if you'll notice on the Pester project, or on quite a few projects, in fact, well, whenever my mouse decides it wants to work again, here we go. Down in the README, there's this build status Team City successful icon. The way that that works is um, there's there's a REST API for Team City, and if we look at the uh, at the raw code here, maybe not raw, let's go into edit. There we go, now we've got some line wrap. So this is Markdown. Um, I don't know if, if, if you're not familiar with Markdown, some of this code will look a little bit funny, but um, links and images both have this syntax of something in square brackets and then something in parentheses. Um, in this case, we've got a link which has the square brackets all the way to here, and then um, so that's sort of the equivalent of the text or image that you'll click on. And then the actual URL is in the parentheses after that. And in this case, the URL is over to the project overview for Pester. So if I, uh, with the, the guest link, so people can go right to here when they click on the, uh, on the build status icon. And then in that first set of square brackets is the image. So it looks almost exactly like a hyperlink except it's got this exclamation point before this the opening square brackets so build status is just the text that would display if the uh, if the browser was not going to actually show the graphic and here's the interesting part here is the link to get the build status icon for the latest build of the pester project um, so you've got https build.powershell.org that's going to be the beginning of everything guest off is how you do um, anonymous access to the REST API. So anything that's publicly readable without having to log on, just slap slash guest off at the beginning of your uh, of your REST URL. And then app REST is the standard stuff to get in there. And then here we go, builds slash, and then you have a uh, sort of qualifier. And here we have build type colon parentheses ID pester underscore test pester. This is the only part that changed. Um, so we'll call this configuration ID. That, I'll show you where to get that from your project in a second, and then slash status icon. So if I go over here, that's what gives me the little successful, or it could be failed, or it could be unknown, or whatever. Um, to get that pester underscore test pester ID, I go over into my project. Um, or in this, I'll, I'm going to look at, uh, at protected data, but it's this build configuration ID thing here. So I would just copy and paste that. So if I go over here and do get rid of pester underscore test pester, and instead I paste in protected data, publish status to GitHub, 
I get the same thing. Um, I'm going to pick one. I think there's one project that has a failed build right now. Yes, PoshSec. So if I go into PoshSec and I pick the, uh, whoops, ah, there we go. And I pick this one, PoshSec, publish status to GitHub. This will just show that it's actually giving the icon specific to that project. So this one should show up as failed. So very easy to do. You can copy and paste this and just change that one little bit of of URL and uh, and you get a nice build status icon on your uh, on your readme.md. So I've done this for all of my my projects on uh, that are on the server. So if I go into protected data for example you get the same thing. You get a build status successful. So, um, and speaking of copy and paste if you just go out to gist.github.com slash dlwyatt uh, there's a public just here that I created today. It's it's named pester version check.ps1, but it has this team city example code. It's actually got multiple files inside of it, so um, you don't have to uh, go. You know, it's it's not just pester version check, but down at the bottom here, status icon.md has both escaped and non-escaped versions of that uh, of that markdown that I showed you from the pester readme file and if you if you go into raw then you just take the first line but um, the escape version was just there to give you something easier to copy and paste without having to to do an edit so that's that uh, another thing that you can do with the rest API that I find uh, kind of useful for my sort of you know, retentive <laughs> nature um, Previously on the Pester project, I remember how I showed you that uh, in our publish releases step, or configuration rather, we have a, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do, Pester publish releases, I always click on the wrong administration button. Okay, so we've got this build step, ensure version numbers and tags match before publishing, and that is actually the the same thing. It uses invoke pester to do it because the code that checks those tags and version numbers and stuff is actually in a pester test file. Um, but if it fails, so if if the tags and for uh, the tag and the version numbers don't match, what would what used to happen was I would get a failed build here. So when I would go out and look at project pester, I would see green on all the tests, green on the publish status to GitHub, red on publish releases. And I hated that because it was intentionally red. I, I didn't want it to, all I wanted it to do was just not publish. So what I figured out um, how to do when I started exploring the REST API was how to actually cancel the build instead of showing it as failed. So if we go into our build chains here, you can see that these are all green and then publish released is canceled instead of failed. And here is how that works. So here's that pester version check.ps1 out in the, the public gist. Shows you, um, I'm going to do this in raw because there we go, now we can see everything. So up here in the try block is the standard um, running of invoke pester, you don't have to worry about that. But the interesting thing is down here in the catch block. So here is where that team city API dot username and password variable that I created in, uh, in, in the parameters of my project gets used. Um, you, do, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, these are names that I made up. Um, it doesn't have to be something dot something. It just seemed like a, a nice way to do it. Um, so I create a PS credential object with that username and password, which pretty standard uh, PowerShell stuff here, converting the password to a secure string. And then here is how in the REST API for Team City, you do a, a cancel of a build. So you, you create this little bit of XML uh, build cancel request element with a comment and a re-add into queue equals false and then the URL um, there's this team city dot server URL will it it's going to point to https uh, build dot powershell dot org but you know on the off chance that that ever changes I use the variable so that that'll stay up to date um, http off unlike guest off this is um, if you want to run invoke rest method or invoke web request and you want to use the dash credential uh, parameter, 
you want to use HTTP authentication because otherwise it's going to bounce you over to the forms based off and that's more awkward to work with. So um, if I were to, uh, and, and here's another automatic variable, teamcity.build.id is the one that is currently running. So um, you don't have to, to fiddle with anything there. But I, I'm just going to show here if I go to, um, If I try to go to build up PowerShell.org HTTP auth, it's going to use, well, I might, might be because I'm already authenticated here. Hang on, go back over to my private window. There we go. So it's using basic authentication instead of forms based and that's what the dash credential uh, parameter from invoke web, web request works really well with. So. Um, so just like guest auth, you just stick the, uh, the HTTP auth part into your thing and then the rest goes over here. Now if I get rid of that, if I go to just app rest builds without that, then it bounces me over to the normal login form and that's not terribly useful for what I want to do. Uh, so that's that. Uh, you have the method equals post, the body is that little bit of XML, you have to set the content type to application slash XML. Cool, as an example, um, oh, one, one thing I didn't mention earlier, but I tend to make uh, explicit exit one calls in all of my uh, scripts that need to run for Team City just to make sure that any errors that happen cause the, the build step to fail. I've noticed that sometimes if I have a PowerShell runner and something goes to the error stream, it logs the error, like it shows up in my log, but it didn't actually cause the build step to fail. So um, it doesn't always do that. It depends on how you set up the step, but I'm just in the habit of doing a lot of error action stop um, and a lot of try catch with exit one, just to make absolutely certain that if anything goes into that catch block or if anything, any errors happen at all, um, I exit with, with status code one. So here's an example of the REST API. Now. How did I figure that out in the first place? Uh, Team City has really nice documentation out there. Uh, if you go out to jetbrains.com slash Team City and you just go into docs and demos and then there's a link here to online reference which goes over to Confluence which is another uh, another product that they use for, for documentation and, and that sort of thing. But um, under where is the, uh... yep, here we go, under extending Team City REST API is all of the documents that that you could want. So in here, you know, I searched for build, uh, build canceling slash stopping, and then there's a thing for build locator uh, that shows you how to construct the URL for a particular build. So that was how I uh, figured out how to do the, um, Where is that? Here we go. The slash build slash ID colon teamcd.build.id. So figuring out what what that was supposed to be and then what to put in the body, all that is out there in the documentation. They're, they're really good about that. So um, there's a lot of exploring you can do there if you want to do other stuff. I mean, basically anything you can do through the web console here, uh, you can do through the REST API. So you can start and stop builds, you can, well, if you were an administrator, you could play with agents, but um, I'm really the only person that has access to do that right now. Um, but yeah, tags, pinning, VCS routes, all kinds of stuff. Um, that's where the, uh, the status icon as well, build status icon, how I figured out that URL was, was straight out of this documentation. Um, so that's that part, and let's see if there was anything else. I'm going to go into Pester again just to, I, I showed how the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, how the published status to GitHub part works. Um, 
here's the uh, the code that publishes to PowerShell get and this is pretty straightforward stuff um, what I'm doing here is is creating a copy of the module without all of the test stuff so this is like a, a distribution copy of it that just has the examples and the um, the module itself and stuff like that and doesn't include actually it does it's going to include a bunch of tests but oh well whatever um, it doesn't include stuff that is only needed for the build so we've got a a Saki build script and a build.bat and stuff like that that gets left out um, and then it just runs publish module so there's nothing really crazy going on there um, but for the publish to chocolatey and to uh, NuGet.org, we don't even have to have any custom code because those are just NuGet feeds, and um, and Team City already knows how to work with those. So if I go into my build steps here, for example, publish to Chocolatey, all we have to do is uh, again here's a another API key that is saved in a secure way. I can't even display what the value is uh, through the console or through the REST API. Um, so I just say HTTPS chocolatey.org. I tell it that it is uh, um, the the package actually comes from the the name of the NuGet package, so it's it's going to be like pester dot version dot whatever, and it just works. Uh, there's there's nothing spiffy that you have to do here. Um, same thing for NuGet.org. It's just uh, I think in that case we use the package sources blank, but if I go to publish to NuGet, yeah, the, the, the default is NuGet.org, so you only have to put something there if you're publishing somewhere else. Um, I will mention that the, the PowerShell gallery itself is also a NuGet feed, but don't use NuGet publish because um, you really want to use the publish module command from the PowerShell get module. Uh, it, it creates tags and metadata and stuff that goes into the NuGet package that is you're probably going to get it wrong if you try to do that yourself. So even though it is technically using NuGet under the hood, forget that you actually are aware of that and just use the module. Um, so let's see if there's anything else that I could uh, show off here. That's really what I, I set out to talk about. I didn't hear any any questions come through while I was gabbing, but if anybody has uh, has anything, good time. Um, yeah, actually, there was some, there was some questions about um, how you get your module into uh, into the PowerShell gallery and uh, oh, okay. publish it. Yep. Um, sure. So it, the question actually came after you showed the, the raw. Um, um, PowerShell code. So I was wondering if somebody, if you could go back and cover that again. Sure. Um, so the the PowerShell gallery is powershellgallery.com. Um, it's still showing up as with this gallery is under limited preview thing, but I thought they made it public. So I'm just gonna open this up here. Because I, I know that they made an announcement about this in the last month or so. That, that it was open to the public? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I just I, I would have expected to see something over here for, for registering new accounts, and I'm, and I'm not. Um, there we go. Introducing the show gallery. There it is. Oh, nope. Here is the. It's, maybe it was on the PowerShell blog, though. Let's uh, look and see. Yeah, here we go. Registration. How do you do this? You simply have to register your Microsoft account once you have registered. Okay, maybe you maybe just do that. Let me go over here and sign out. Oh, okay, yeah, there's a register link right here. Perfect. So you you register um, your Microsoft account. You sign in. And once you're in, I'm not going to click on this because it'll announce my API key to the world, but you click on your username and up in one of the tabs that's available there is your NuGet API key. Um, 
you can also go in there and revoke it and get a new one if uh, if it does happen to get exposed. But that's what you would copy and paste um, over into your um, into your team city variables. I'm going to show off something really briefly here. Um, so in publish releases, configuration settings, parameters, I've got PowerShell get API key and it shows up as secure dot whatever. So if I create a sample uh, sample value here, it's a configuration parameter, that's fine. And by default, it's just going to save it as a string. So I had I put my API key in there, it's now basically exposed to the world. Um, and I would, even if I very quickly fix that, I would go back and change the API key and uh, revoke it and get a new one. So what you have to do is click edit under spec here and choose display hidden and type password. And now value still shows up as this is not secure, but once I click save, now it is this secure.teamcity.password, and even if I go in and edit, that's that's all I can do. So now I, I would copy and paste this uh, this reference, this stuff, including it in between the, the percent signs, and either pass that as an argument to a script or um, embed it directly in the code if I'm doing the, that type of uh, PowerShell thing here. So once I've got that, so I've got my API key securely stored here or username and password for, for other types of secrets or whatever. But um, I go over into the build step. And the, again, this, this sample code is out on uh, gist.github.com slash dlwyatt. But we, uh, we just basically run publish module. So you give it a path to the, to the module folder. And you don't have to do all this stuff with uh, creating another copy of the module. If you just want to publish everything that's in your source control repository as is, then this, uh, this teamcity.build.checkout directory could be your path. So I would still assign it to a variable like this, but then instead of dash path dollar temp down here, I would just do dollar path and all of this other code from uh, between lines 11 and 26 would just go away. So I would just import module PowerShell get, even that's uh, not strictly necessary because module auto-loading does happen, but this gives me the error action stop and stuff. Um, and then you just run publish module and, and off you go. So the only thing that is specific to me in all of this code is that API key. That's how it knows what account to, to upload. And as long as that API key is associated with an account that has access to the project, or if it's a new project, it'll get created and associated with your account, then it'll be okay. Um, if anybody else, for example, tries to publish to Pester um, and they are not me or Jakub or uh, it may be just be the two of us right now, um, somebody that has been given access to the Pester project on PowerShell Gallery, then it'll give you an error. It'll say that that's, that's not going to happen. So if I go into, um, let's see, let's find Pester. Yeah, here we go. So you can grant people owner access to your project and allow them to publish. But for now, there's uh, there's just two of us up on Pester, so, and many of my other modules um, are just me. And that's, you know, how the bulk of the, uh, the bulk of the modules up here are likely to be but for, for the community. We tend to write and publish our own stuff, so. Um, All right, well, okay. we have another question. Okay. Uh, this, uh, Manuel Hanke uh, asks, he says it's a little bit off topic, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, what, what practice do you use when versioning script modules? And does that play into uh, Team City builds at all? What I try to do is use uh, semantic versioning. So um, for new public API stuff that is still backwards compatible, I do a minor release. And for breaking changes, I do a major release. Um, and then for everything else that is that doesn't change the API at all, just little bug fixes and stuff. That's the uh, um, what is it? Major, minor, uh, whatever the third number is. So you know, major dot minor dot 
something. Um, mm -hmm. Now, as far as Team City goes, you'll notice that it it does have um, build numbers here. So we've got like number seven, number seven, number seven. Those are not linked to the actual version of the module in any way. Um, you can do that. You can have Team City track the build numbers in a major dot minor dot whatever dot build um, approach, and you can have the build numbers of your application or module take their cues from this. But I find that while that is helpful um, for some things, it's Really, what I would tend to do is this number seven here. Um, I could incorporate that as the build number in in the version. So if if I wanted to do the, uh, um, you know, I'm just gonna bring something up here real quick because it's driving me a little bit crazy that I can't remember the. All right, so. Uh, So it is revision, uh, build and revision, okay. So major, minor, build and revision. So um, I guess that's weird. Minor revision is four, oh, whatever. This this fourth number tends to be the, the build from source control. So like if I look at PS version table and we've got 5.0.10.240.16.384, which is kind of a mess, but um, these are version numbers assigned by Microsoft, and then the 16384 comes from their build server. So that was the 16,384th build of PowerShell is what wound up being released. So you could take that from Team City if you wanted to and, and put it into the module, but I don't personally do that. All right. And then uh, there's another question uh, wondering if you'll ever give a presentation or a blog posting about uh, on uh, desired state configuration tooling plus Team City plus Octopus Deploy. Sure. Um, <laughs> can can I can't you tell us what Octopus Deploy is? Yeah, yeah. Octopus Deploy is a um, it's a product mainly for de deploying .NET um, applications, so NuGet packages, essentially. I guess that doesn't have to be .NET, but it's it's very much a um, Windows focused tool. Although it, with um, if you've got Mono on Linux, so that it supports .NET code, you can run stuff there as well. But um, we use Octopus Deploy in in my company and DevOps guys as as the mechanism for getting our DSC configurations out to servers. So instead of using a DSC pull server, we use um, Octopus Deploy, and I'll I'll show you why. Uh, that's private browsing. Um, hmm. Well, maybe I maybe I shouldn't show you why, because I would have to do this on a customer's uh, build server, and yeah, there's nothing sensitive there. Hang on, let me make sure I'm connected to the VPN. Uh, I am cool. So if I go to build dot yeah, or not build deploy rather, uh, and I go into the DSC configuration project, what we get is this nice dashboard showing the version of the configuration as it goes through the environments. And it um, by using Octopus Deploy, we we get for free this concept of uh, defining environments and having a, a promotion workflow and stuff. Um, so the the version here in this case comes from Team City when it creates the the release after all the tests pass, and then in Octopus we can do the uh, the promotions. So like if I go into my development um, release here and this was successful, let's say this was a new version, then I can I'll have a promote button up here, and I can or I can deploy to multiple things at once if I for whatever reason want to just do that. Um, so anyhow, it's it's re it's really about that that dashboard and and the the promotion mechanism. That was the sort of the the feature that we wanted to have. We wanted to have customers quickly able to see at a glance what was in their environment, the same way that they would with their applications. Um, and we weren't getting that kind of visibility with a DSC pull server. 
um, as far as talking about this goes, I'm actually, my company is putting on a, uh, a thing in, in London next month just after the European PowerShell Summit uh, called WinOps. It says DevOps on Windows thing. So I, I have no idea if it's going to be um, recorded, but that's the sort of thing that I'm going to be talking at, at, about in the, uh, the workshop panels in the afternoon there. And then afterwards, um, I could certainly come back and do something similar with, with PowerShell.org um, on a, as another tech session. Cool. Sounds good. Um, and I think we're out of questions. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, that's it for now. Other than, you know, if, if you're interested in, in using uh, build.powershell.org, please send me an email and, and get your project out there because we're, uh, we're paying for it and it's, <laughs> you know, I, I really want to see people getting on board with, uh, with using it. I mean, if, if you have pester test and you want them to be run automatically every time you check something in, free and, and relatively easy way to do it. Um, there's another thing out there that's very commonly used is appveyor.org and they have a really, really nice product. Oops, appveyor.com maybe. Yep, .com. Okay. Um, very similar product to Team City and a very similar approach to having uh, build agents that run a single build and then get thrown away for security reasons. The the only thing that held me back from using that there was um, the, the desire to be able to run uh, tests on all these versions of PowerShell. So the app fair agents, I believe, are running PowerShell v4, and you can't get anything older than that. Um, so by by deploying our own build server over here, we have total control over the, the capabilities of these build agents. Oh, you know what? I, I forgot to look at something in the... Uh, in the test here, and I wanted to point it out, if, if you're creating your own um, build configurations and build steps, when you create a, a PowerShell build step, um, I pointed out that there's this uh, this version drop down here. You notice that I've got this set to any. The reason that I'm not telling it to run, and in this case on PowerShell version 2, in fact, let me, I'm going to just create a uh, a bogus um, project here for a second. So, and if I create a build configuration, create a yeah, that's fine. We don't actually need source control right now. I create a uh, PowerShell build step. Oops, PowerShell. There we go. No, oh, hey. <laughs> it really wants me to do end unit. There we go. And I say PowerShell version 2 x64. And uh, here I'll just uh, kill a puppy. There. So that's fine. Let me save that. And now, so it says PowerShell 2.0 x64 script. Great. If I go into agent requirements, Notice that it automatically did, and this is ugly to read, but it's going to look for PowerShell agent that has version 2 or 3 or 4 or 5. This, I think, is a poor decision on the, uh, the authors of the PowerShell build runner at Team City because maybe they are not aware of this, but what will happen, actually, version 3 is an even better example. So if I go over here and change that version 2 to version 3, Oh, and it'll demonstrate what the problem is. Um, and then I go into agent requirements and now, so it's three, four, or five. So here's my home system. I've got PowerShell version five, it's Windows 10, blah, blah, blah. If I do PowerShell.exe-version 2.0, hopefully I've installed PowerShell v2. Yep, I have, okay. Um, oh except something in my profile script is not v2 compatible at the moment. That's fine. doesn't matter. PS version table, great. I'm running PowerShell version 2. No problem. If I run PowerShell.exe 
version 3.0. Should work, right? I'm still running PowerShell version 5. <laughs> um, PowerShell version 2 can exist side by side with 3 or later because they target different versions of the .NET framework. PowerShell version 2 is .NET 2. PowerShell 3, 4, and 5 are .NET uh, 4. Dot whatever at uh, 4.0 or 4.5. So in Team City, what could happen is my my uh, PowerShell version 3 step could actually wind up running on version 5 and not giving me the, the, the result that I wanted. So what you can do here is you can add your own requirement, and in this case I can use the exact same PowerShell underscore x64, except now instead of saying uh, matches with a, a whole bunch of stuff here, I can say starts with three dot, and now it would only run, you know, it just ignoring this uh, this build step requirement. So that's that's why I just set the uh, the thing to any because I was using um, using my own agent requirement anyway. So now it's going to say PowerShell x64 exists, which is fine, but um, I'm explicitly saying it has to start with three dot. You can do it this way if you want to. Um, you'll notice that if you look at the uh, at the projects that were built from from the template, it looks a little bit different. The agent requirements will say environment.ps version starts with three dot instead of PowerShell underscore x64. The reason for that is that at the time that I set this template project up, uh, the PowerShell build runner didn't know about five, so this PowerShell underscore x64 would, would only ever be two, three, or four. And so on our build agents, I set an environment variable um, to, uh, to, to do it that way. But same idea, I'm just explicitly telling it to run on the, uh, on the correct version. So that's, that's that. Um, there's other requirements, and in fact, I, well, I don't know if other people can see this agents tab or not, or if it requires some administration stuff. But under the uh, under these agent pools, you can look at what the capabilities are. So each one of these AMIs is one of them is the PowerShell version two AMI and and three, four, and five. Um, but there's a agent parameters thing here that shows all of the capabilities of that agent. So uh, configuration parameters will show what version of the .NET framework is there, and every single one of these names you can use in a uh, agent requirements clause if you want to. So you could say that you need a system that has .NET framework 4.5 64-bit installed, so you could say that .NET framework 4.5 underscore x64 exists, you know, or starts with 4.5 or whatever. Um, same thing here, Microsoft Build Tools, uh, PowerShell, x64, and x86, um, whatever logic you, you think you can come up with, all of that stuff can go into, uh, uh, where's my demonstration project, all of that stuff can go into the agent requirements of a build configuration. And you notice here that um, that it's showing three incompatible agents now because I told it to specifically look for PowerShell version three. Watch what happens if I delete this and go back to the uh, to using the built-in thing here. So I want it to be PowerShell version three x64, and now if I go into agent requirements, it's showing me that it's compatible with the 3, 4, and 5 build agent, and the only one that it's not compatible with is the version 2 box. So something to be aware of, but it's it's already set up that way by default for the uh, for the build steps that come from the template project. So when we onboard your project and start it off with a copy of this, you can go in here and you can see in the on the template project that the uh, that it's set up with the with the right versioning. Any other questions? No, that's really it. Um, so if somebody wanted to to, um, to join build.powershell.org, how should they reach out to you? On Twitter, uh, email, 
just just on email. If you, as soon as you register yourself an account on build.powershell.org, you'll come to a screen very much like this, um, but with a little less uh, administration buttons, and uh, it'll have the same banner across the top that has a link to my email address and also a link over to the uh, to the community build server page on PowerShell.org. Uh, All right. And in fact, this this page here, PowerShell.org, WP, well, it's under Resources Community Build Server across the top here. Um, it mentions that your project needs to be publicly accessible. It needs to have an open source license, uh, typically, you know, GPL or MIT or Apache or whatever. But there's a link to the uh, to the open source.org approved licenses thing. And so, as long as you're open source, which you have to be in order to meet our uh, all of the free stuff that we're getting, you know, we've got uh, SSL certificates and open source license for Team City. All this is because we are only supporting open source projects with this with this environment. Um, this will tell you how to do all that stuff. So you send me an email with a link to your repository and your username on build.powershell.org, so I know who to assign the project to, and. Uh, and yeah, there's there's a little bit of explanation of how this uh, how to get your um, personal access token on GitHub and and some things like that. So if you have any other questions, by all means, uh, email, Twitter, whatever. I'm I'm always here. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate yeah. it. No problem. Take care. All right. And uh, next next month uh, we're doing uh, the top ten considerations when creating a PowerShell module with. Um, uh, PowerShell function, excuse me, with uh, Mike Robbins. And so uh, join us there. Uh, you can find more information at PowerShell.org. Uh, thanks again, Dave. No problem.